Before I get into the talk, I'll just give a um, add a little bit to my background. Um, Miguel kind of told you my academic um, you know, background in general, but I, uh, I got a bachelor's degree at UC Irvine in political science, but also studied earth science and actually started to really get into research on the physical science side where uh, I did master's in geography at San Diego State. Um, you know, it seems disparate from transportation, but I studied ocean biogeochemical cycling and uh, hydro uh, terrestrial hydrology. Uh, but I, um, I kind of uh, took a break and worked as a consultant for five years um, to, to find a new research path. And I found it in transportation. And that's where I found myself at UC Davis um, back in 2013 in a TTP program. And um, since then, I've been doing nothing but transportation research and uh, specifically bicycling research. So this talk today is is, is my journey in the past eight and a half years, really. Um, so you'll get to see a lot of things from my dissertation and a lot of current, um, current research as well. So um, yeah, anyway, hopefully it's fun and um, feel free to interrupt along the way or hold your questions at the end. However, whatever you feel like, I'm happy to be interrupted. Um, I will say that some of the, this talk originally was designed for a more general audience, so there are a few intro transportation slides that uh, you'll probably all roll your eyes at, but I'll, I'll try to move through them quickly. So I, I'm calling this from psychology to sustainability, how bikes and scooters are reshaping urban mobility, um, and you'll see why in just a second. So let's see if I can advance the slide. Ah, so the bicycle, uh, most of this talk is going to be about um, how people use the bicycle. So it's not about the bicycle, but it's about um, its use in day-to-day -day life. And the interesting thing to note is that the bicycle really hasn't changed that much for 135 years. Um, and you can see that by a modern day picture of a bicycle uh, where I'm riding with my kids on the Davis Greenbelt. Uh, I think most people think of bicycling as, as a recreational activity. And certainly there's lots of social benefit um, to riding for recreation, um, physical and emotional health being the top. Um, but also bicycling can be used for, you know, more, you know, what I call destination oriented travel, hauling kids, hauling goods, getting you to a workplace, getting you, you know, to a, you know, where the destination, you're trying to do something at an activity location. Um, so I'm going to focus primarily on that, but don't want to lose sight of the importance um, for bicycling in, um, in a recreation sense too, because sometimes transportation and urban planners forget how important um, recreation is as well. So uh, just a quick plug for why um, transportation, our transportation sector needs to change. I know you all know this, but um, really our car dominated focus on transportation has gotten us into some, um, some major environmental problems. So uh, emissions are gonna be a top, top motivator in all the work that I do. And on the emissions side, really what I'm talking about is this left-hand side of, of the graph where there's so much great work being done here and at, at UC Davis on the right-hand side, we've had great policy um, even on the transportation side, but it's still on the right-hand side of the transportation side of this graph. And on the left-hand side is, is, is the kind of harder, harder problem to tackle. And uh, I know if you've taken Dan Sperling's class, he'll talk a lot about how um, the reducing driving, our efforts to reduce driving just have, you know, have failed in, in a large degree. Um, so I'm going to, you know, tackle what I think is the hardest problem, and that is changing people's travel behavior. Um, and that's both by reducing their travel, but also by changing how the mode of travel they choose. But sustainability isn't just about emissions, right? Sustainability is much broader. It's about all these other important aspects of the way we live. So safety, 
um, our transportation system has, a, we have a major safety epidemic in our transportation system. Uh, we have historical racism in transportation planning, um, and we have general disinvestment in, um, in communities um, that we've neglected for you know, decades. And, and, and these two issues can collide, right? A lot of these themes in, in what I broadly think of as sustainability, they're not independent of each other. So the graphic on the right um, by Dangerous by Design shows that justice and safety you know, collide. They are, they are one issue in some respects. And then more broadly, um, you know, sustainability is about livability too. It's about how, how we live in our cities. It's, it's oftentimes transportation planners and engineers think about um, mobility as the, the, as the pinnacle of what transportation is, um, but, but not really, right? Mo for, for the most part, people don't have a, a need to just move. They have a need to live and, um, and interact with other people. And so, so part, of, part of the motivation for studying bicycling is, is to envision a place where we're not just moving, but we're, you know, have, we're, having, we're living better. All right, so some of the main challenges for mode shifting. Uh, I apologize, I, I pulled a graphic um, uh, that sh shows some development patterns from San Diego that I first gave this talk in San Diego. Um, but if you're familiar with most sprawling US cities, that the, uh, the graphic is the same. You, you see this kind of outward trend in, um, in growth, uh, followed by these leapfrog developments, which are these you know, new pockets of development that are or sometimes you hear it called in the exurbs, these things that are just far away from, from the core city um, in the early part or the mid part of the 20th century. And so land use patterns are probably at the top of the list for, um, for how, for the as a challenge for changing or reducing driving and changing um, mode use. Distances are just too far, right, um, for bicycling. Uh, but we also have tons of effective subsidies for car travel. Um, you know, classic classic ones include highway building, but also parking. Um, and these land use patterns and, and effective subsidies have kind of created this historical inertia that f has, has focused so heavily on congestion. Um, and still congestion, if you talk to anyone about transportation, what's the first thing they bring up? You know, oh, when are you gonna solve that congestion problem, right? Um, it's, it's still the top of everyone's mind, even engineers and planners. So road design has naturally followed the, this progression to prioritize cars. Um, and we've made some recent progress, right? For example, CEQA, uh, the California Environmental Equality Act used to consider level of service or the delay to vehicles as an environmental impact. Um, and it now doesn't, it includes vehicle miles traveled because vehicle miles traveled has such so much a closer connection to actual environmental impacts. Um, so there are big changes going on right now um, that are trying to break this historical inertia. And then the other thing I would note is that bike advocacy kind of let this happen, or maybe even um, we're a part of it, uh, because the advocacy movement in in the United States uh, in the middle of 20th century on was really afraid that planners and engineers were going to um, uh, we're going to push bicyclists to the sidewalk. They wanted the right to access the road. And in doing so, they promoted this idea that bikes are vehicles, which they are, but, but that those vehicles need to share the space with cars. And so for decades, decades in our country, um, there, was no, there was no movement to provide safe and separate um, you know, facilities for people to ride their bikes. So uh, bike research has grown a lot, and I, I feel so fortunate um, to fall into this, um, this boom in bike research because uh, in the 90s, there was, you know, before the 90s, very little. In the 90s, there's this, you know, sprinkling of bike research, and then it just exploded. And, and what we now know are that, especially in, in places like this, the American cities, that distance and safety are the primary, primary barriers. Um, Professor Susan Handy and many others um, like to use the phrase that 
you know, you need short distances and you need safe environments as a, you know, as a precursor to bison. It can occur without that, but, but it's not necessarily sufficient enough for bicycling to be in. There have to be these other things um, in many cases. And so here are a few other, um, you know, a list of a few other things we know from, from you know, continued research on this. But I'm still primarily focused on these, these big barriers of distance and safety uh, and how they, um, and how the role they play at the, the person level. So I wanna take um, one quick look at the policy levers because in bike research, it's pretty straightforward. Infrastructure is the top of the list, right? We think of um, bike lanes, protected bike lanes. These are the things that our cities don't have necessarily and, and they haven't, we haven't designed for bikes. So um, designing for in our infrastructure for bikes and other small vehicles, scooters, um, this is something that a lot of cities are doing now. Um, and we've done in the past. So this image on the right is actually a, a, an image from Davis in the 70s, where if you look carefully, that's, that's a parking protected uh, bike lane, um, something that seems so new and novel to us because we've just recently rediscovered it. Um, but it, but it, Davis, Davis was, um, you know, has this amazing history for bicycling and they were experimenting a lot in the 70s. So besides infrastructure, a lot is talked about um, encouragement and education. These are things that are done in somewhat of a, um, um, they're done in the US as, oh yeah, they're important, we do them, um, but they're not important enough to make a big deal about it. Uh, so we don't have like mandatory training in schools, which we could, other countries like the Netherlands do. Um, we don't have a lot of um, encouragement at, at schools or at um, you know incentives. Um, incentives are just starting to emerge for for bicycling in the form of you know commuter benefits, um, you know tax benefits. They've they've kind of come and gone with the different um, um, you know legislative cycles, and we're starting to see e-bike incentives. So there's there's some movement in um, incentivizing bike travel, um, but for the most part, again, not a high priority. And then services are new um, for the most part. Um, the bike share was the first time that, um, you know, you, we could see a mobility service focused on bikes and, and bike share has not been around very long, you know, 15 years, maybe, maybe a little longer. Um, and of course, with privatizing of, of micro mobility services, now we see services potentially playing a much bigger role. In terms of research that connects um, to these policy levers, I'm going to be talking about two. One is psychology, um, and within psychology, mostly focusing on perceptions and attitudes. And then, um, of course, behavior is what we really care about um, in terms of you know changing behavior to to improve sustainability. So I, when I talk about travel behavior, I'm mostly talking about travel decision making, and in a lot of contexts. All right. So let's dive in to some of my research. The first is the most basic psychological level, and that is this kind of autonomic response that we have when we go about our day. Um, that's our body's kind of unconscious uh, reaction to our environment. Uh, and we also have cognitive evaluations of these things, uh, which can lead to attitudes and, um, and they change. And, and the, all these things influence our behavior. Um, so these are kind of precursors to behavior change. There's, there's been uh, a little bit of research on um, what kind of environments are kind of comfortable and safe for bicycling. And more recently, there's been this big interest in understanding that at a fundamental um, level. And so I, when I started my dissertation, I thought, that sounds very fascinating. My wife is a cognitive scientist. I figured I could lean a little heavily on her expertise to help me through um, the tough neuroscience. Um, and I, you know, kind of did this pretty risky experiment. Uh, and the experiment went something like this. I wanted to measure bicyclist stress physiologically. Uh, I wanted to measure their psychological stress through their physiology. Um, because survey measures have a lot of flaws and a lot of issues. Um, and I wanted to know more, you know, acutely at different, you know, levels of what exactly is going on at the, 
um, at a bicyclist perspective and what's causing them to feel stressed or not stressed to help us better design um, facilities for bicycles. So what I did was I did some research on what kind of um, devices to use and I settled on heart rate variability as my key metric. Um, heart rate variability is a little counterintuitive. If you have high heart rate variability like me in this deep breathing exercise in the orange, um, that's a relaxed state. Um, so that those, the variability in my heart, that's the time between my successive heartbeats is tracking my respiration. So you can see me taking a big breath in and exhaling and my heart speeds up, speeds up, speeds up, speeds up, slows down, slows down, slows down. We like to think of our heart as being this very constant thing, but actually the time between our heartbeats is constantly changing. Um, and then of course, when you're stressed, um, this, uh, the variability gets um, kind of greatly reduced. Uh, and so the idea is um, I wanted to model individuals variability in their heart rate uh, or in their heart uh, in their heart successive heart piece to give an indication of when they were stressed and then to figure out what they were stressed about. So I did this by recruiting uh, 20 very generous uh, undergraduate women to ride on some roads in Davis um, and you know, since you got, since a lot of this audience is familiar with Davis, these roads um, may be familiar to you. But um, so they rode on Russell Boulevard, not the bike path. They rode with the cars on Russell Boulevard. They rode on Anderson, on B Street, on Oak Avenue, and on College Avenue, which is a little loop um, off of Russell, quiet um, street. And what I found was um, a little ambiguous. Uh, I, I found that I couldn't really differentiate something like Russell, which is very, very stressful. So this, this x-axis is my the response variable, the high, HFRR stands for high frequency. Um, RR is the interval between successive R peaks in, your, in, your, um, in the contraction of your heart. So, so you expect that, I expected that this kind of, the low scale of this is more stressful. So that I expected this kind of trend that I see, but the trend's pretty subtle. Right, Russell and Anderson look indistinguishable, yet we know that Russell is way, way, way more crazy to ride on. I mean, no one rides on Russell unless you're a recreational cyclist going, you know, 20 something miles an hour. Um, but we do see this big outlier of college, which is the kind of the calmest, um, quiet residential street, beautiful tree canopy. Um, it's a very relaxing place to ride a bike. Um, and so the controlling for as much as I could, you know, try to get them to ride at a comfortable pace, made sure not to ride in too extreme wind or air temperature. Um, you know, we still don't get, I didn't get anything that was, you know, exactly what I hypothesized, right? So not good for a dissertation study um, to get null results, um, but important nonetheless to show that maybe there's, there's more that needs to be done. So later I went back to a lot of this data and looked at, okay, how well did my experiment work? When I, when I forget about the, when I look at what the survey responses were. So I, I interviewed these people, I took, I had them a battery of surveys um, and they had rest periods between each ride to try to you know, wash out any effect from one experimental condition to another. They were randomized, I mean, I, I did, I followed everything I could to try to find, you know, find this signal. And, um, and so on this graphic, what I was doing is, is trying to, to model their, their um, survey response, um, looking at the heart rate variability and, and see whether there was an effect. And I expected these lines, I'm not gonna get into the details of the graphic because it's a little complicated, but I expected them to all be kind of downward sloping and they were kind of, right? Again, um, not as clearly as I would have hoped. Um, so eventually in this paper, I just, I just kind of came to the similar conclusions like, well, there's pretty weak connection between the, um, the physiological stress response and the survey responses. And that's pretty problematic um, because if we can't get a cognitive appraisal that relates to a physiology, it's hard to know whether what we're measuring physiologically is what we think we're measuring even if there's decades of research on how heart rate variability tracks stress, because there is in labs for different, um, 
for different um, research topics. So this led to some collaboration with some researchers at uh, University of British Columbia. And we got on these Zoom calls and had a lot of really fascinating talks about what it was going to take for this research to move forward. Because since I, I started that research, I was number two. Um, one, there was only one other study at the time when I started it that tried to do this for bicycling. Now there's, uh, I wouldn't say 20, but in the teens, number of studies around the world trying to measure um, both walking and bicycling now. Um, stress and other kind of precognitive um, um, psych psychological constructs through physiology. And what we realized is that no one had a good sense of, of controlling the things that we needed to control. And so this really complicated graphic is what we came up with of what's really needed. And it, it, it looks daunting, and it is, um, to understand all the things that we need to measure and we need to control for in order to just know whether the metric we've we've we're using is what we think it is. It's it's going to take a lot more work, um, and it's going to take a lot of kind of basic science work uh, before we can really know that this is ready for the field. So if this isn't ready for the field, uh, what else can we do? Um, well, we, we can continue to do what we've been doing, which is using surveys and, and do them maybe a little bit better. So in this study, we used um, videos of just road environments. This is actually in, um, some road environments in the Bay Area. Uh, and we, we, we showed those really short video clips to actually uh, the campus travel survey at UC Davis. So a really large sample of, of people in Davis who, who you know, are familiar with bicycling because they live in Davis. So they have this kind of unique lens into understanding comfort uh, in terms of bicycling, but totally alien environments for most of them, right? They've never ridden a bike on these, on these roads. Um, and what we, what we wanted to do is better understand what are the parameters in these videos that lead to more comfort. Um, so, so we're moving into the cognitive and evaluative sides of psychology, not into the kind of, um, unconscious side and and with all this data and some modeling we, we we kind of came up with some scenarios for how we might change um both an arterial and a collector a standard arterial and collector in um in this case the bay area but really could withstand many many could represent many you know, usc's and so if you look at the three colored lines the red is the poor poorly designed road or the green is the you know more moderately designed road and then uh, which may be in a lot of design guides uh, and then the blue is this good road this road that's pretty much beyond anything a design guide would recommend trying to be as as comfortable as we possibly could based on what we were learning in the models and what we found is that well with 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 the current on-street design so i should say this experiment didn't include off-street um, facilities for bikes so, on, so when bikes, bike lanes, and bike facilities need to be located on the road with cars, uh, we really couldn't shift, um, we couldn't make them very comfortable for the majority of people. We could reduce, so you can see those red lines um, there, you know, most people, um, you know, 75% or more probability of that, you know, that it's going to be very uncomfortable. We could reduce that. So, I, so we, sh we flattened out the comfort, the comfort scale which makes it more likely that people are gonna feel comfortable. But we couldn't flip it, which is what we wanted to be able to do, right? We wanted to be able to flip this really kind of downward sloping curve um, to an upward sloping curve where we have an environment that's just comfortable for the masses. Um, and so this leads to a couple interesting conclusions. One, maybe it's not possible with on-road facilities. We really do need separate um, facilities to make the majority of people feel comfortable. Um, but it also leads to some interesting things about um, our plan, our plans and, um, and policies and designs. So bike research recently has got this kind of emergence of a bunch of different ideas of how we should allocate our resources. Um, so, you know, the, the design or the, the concept on the left is about targeting different you know, user groups. And then on the, the one on the right, which is really fuzzy, I just realized, um, 
is, is an all ages and abilities. I think it comes from um, Vancouver. Um, and it's really, it's really kind of trying to define more like a break point um, of, okay, this is what you should be designing and this is what you shouldn't be designing. So it's, it's less about targeting um, a specific user group. Uh, and then this all ages and abilities is similarly adopted in NACTO recently. Uh, and then, and this is kind of what we hoped this research would inform, and that is these roadway context variables, how they all align into kind of a standard, right? So um, this is probably the best case use case in our in our design guides from from our research, and and they kind of align. Like what we found kind of aligns here with NACTO's um, design guides that we are talking about on street facilities right in the middle here where um, some of them just really should be protected lanes, but they're not, not according to NACTO design guidelines. You know, the, the volumes, the bike, the car volumes are too high, speeds may be too, um, too great. There's a lot of curbside activity. There's all these things that are going on. So no wonder people aren't feeling comfortable. Um, and, and, you know, NACTO's guide is great. Um, it's still, it's, it's, it's North American focus, which is good. We need that. But it's not as you know strong as say the Crow Manual uh, in the Netherlands, which if you look back, um, the NACTO allows almost double the the, the vehicle volume um, on a cycle lane before um, jumping to a separated path. Uh, the Crow pretty much says you have more than three thousand cars, you should never put a bike lane um, on that via on that road. So, so there's still there's still room to grow uh, in the U.S. in terms of how strong we want to be in, in um, you know creating environments for bicycling. And then the nitty gritty details also matter. So here's some examples of the different design guides for for uh, bike lane widths, and we played around with bike lane width in our in our models, and and we did find that you know at increasing bike lane width you know was going to make things more comfortable um is it to the degree that you know something that's six feet versus seven feet really matters I, i'm not really sure um we know the standard five foot lane that we've been using in the u.s is is not really adequate um and so so nacto um, recommends a six foot lane and the crow something that kind of ranges depending on the on the context and in davis we have uh, amazing new uh, bike lane standards. If you've ridden around recently, you've seen really wide bike lanes, buffers when there when there's space, really thick striping. There's there are so many um, you know these little design things that matter in terms of making for a comfortable space. Okay, so what we're getting at is someone's comfort level. What I was trying to get at is a comfort level or some some deep you know psychological feeling. Um, uh, that might that might provide me safety and comfort, but really might make me more likely to ride a bike or make the whole population feel like biking is an option. Um, and so this next section uh, or theme of research is trying to move beyond psychology and toward behavior. Um, and the first study I want to bring up is um, a study about bicyclist route choices. And route choices have often been um, seen as a window into environmental preferences and you can think of that as if someone chose a route if you compare the characteristics of that route to alternative routes then it might tell you something about oh like you know the attributes of the route they chose they, they probably they probably influenced their their choice so we're not really measuring preferences um, i think sometimes in in the literature that issue kind of gets gets a little fuzzy. Um, even the best design modeler models they they forget that we're not measuring preferences, we're measuring behavior, but we're inferring preferences. Um, but these differ from stated preferences in important ways um, because we we we're not there's like in surveys we're so concerned about little biases and how people want to be perceived, um, and so it's. It's something of a check on normal surveys where we ask people like in the video survey, was this more comfortable than this? Um, so the data is also pretty fascinating too. So this data comes from um, San Francisco and we designed the study to fit 
uh, right after this big emergence of bike infrastructure in San Francisco in the early 2000, in the early teens. Um, and we wanted to evaluate the trade-off of people's routes um, over this infrastructure and existing infrastructure. And what we did was we used um, GPS data from the Cycle Tracks app, which is run by the County Transportation Authority. Um, and we, you know, did all the classic data cleaning that was needed uh, to generate, you know, to try to estimate the routes that people rode on. This was the first time that a that a government, an American government, built an app to track bicycling. Um, this app has been used in many other cities since then. Um, and of course, now with um, the, um, you know, with private uh, companies doing this, Strava, a, a lot of, a lot, there's been a lot of movement in the research field to use, to use that data. Um, but the nice thing about this was it was, you know, we worked in partnership with the Transportation Authority and they, they just gave us the data. Um, so if you look at, you know, not only trip distribution, but also, um, you know, flows here, you can see that, well, the data really is, if you know San Francisco, um, it's really, this is really destination oriented travel for the most part. If you ever looked at a, a heat map from Strava of bike routes in San Francisco, there's this big loop around the city, um, which shows that, you know, they're, they're tracking a lot of um, recreational riding. But in this, in this, in this data, we're, we're really tracking more destination oriented stuff. Uh, there's recreation here too. Recreation, recreational riding is really hard to deal with in a route choice model. Uh, if you if you take um, Giovanni's uh, discrete choice class, you'll maybe get a sense of why that is. We also did this in Davis, and I want to give a big shout out to um, Calvin Thigpen if he's here, because um, he was the first one to collect routes on paper maps in um, Davis, and he also helped with the San Francisco project too. Um, and it, so it's a it's a similar idea as we were just focused on the commute to UC Davis campus, and um, but we wanted the same we wanted to do the same things like what are the what are the preferences even in a bike friendly town um, for you know getting to campus. So we did this kind of parallel study, or eventually I did this parallel study between um, bike routes in Davis and San Francisco. I'm just going to show some of the results in San Francisco because I think they're, you know, perhaps a little more interesting. Um, on the on the x-axis of these is the, um, this kind of proportion along a route, so you can think about it like how much of the route has this thing. So on the bottom we see proportion of off-street paths or protected bike lanes in those bottom panels, and on the y-axis uh, is the predicted um, percent distance equivalent. It's a little confusing. Um, until you look at the top right and you look at the proportion of routes with 4% or greater upslope are really upward sloping, right? And that's so that's positive distance equivalent. So riding on a steep hill is like adding a lot of distance. That's how you can think about it. Um, so all the good things on a bike route, we would expect downward slopes. And we do. We see downward slopes for all kinds of things that we think matter, conventional bike lanes, um, on different major or minor arterials. Um, but most fascinating are is the variation. Um, and there's some trip context variation with these three colored lines. But the difference between something like a protected bike lane, if you look at that bottom left panel and see how downward sloping that is compared to say, um, oh, I don't know, a conventional bike lane above it. Uh, there's, a pretty, there's a pretty strong, um, change and so so the the inference that we tend to make with these models is that the value of a protected bike lane is greater because these are these are essentially marginal rates of substitution so people are willing to ride further out of their way for that protected bike lane than they are for that conventional bike lane so it gets us one step closer to um, to providing some estimate of value of bike infrastructure okay what if we move beyond route choices um, to the ultimate behavior that we care about, and that is mode choice, where we, we want people to shift the mode that they use. We want them to get out of their cars and use a bike or some other system. Uh, so in this study, kind of, it's a big integration of all these ideas of the psychological um, uh, components, but also the environmental components. And the context was three high schools, um, you know, these, these are high school kids traveling to uh, three different high schools uh, in 
Davis, uh, Sequoia High, River City, and Tam High, and Mill Valley. Uh, and on the on the psychological side, um, it was all attitude statements. So we looked at some um, important attitudes we knew were important for travel, but also attitudes that we suspected were important for travel for teenagers. So enjoyment, self-image, social pressure, um, attitudes about their environment. But then also these environmental metrics. So these percent of bike lanes along likely routes from home to school. Um, and we, we combined all this into a model, a mode choice, and then simulated what it would take to get more teenagers to, to change how they travel. And what was, I think, most interesting about these simulations were that improving the road environment just alone just what wasn't going to do much. So you can see that's moving from the baseline to that, that circle dot in the bike panel. You can see, yeah, it increases biking a little bit. And chauffeuring goes down and driving goes down a little bit and, and walking even goes down. So you're shifting away from a lot of those modes to, to bike. Um, but it's not until you get to the later and the stronger scenarios where you really need improved road environments, you need shorter distances to school, which is, which is more about school siting and residential development. These are long-term um, strategies. And you also need um, better bicycling attitudes. And of course, Attitudes and behavior are cyclical or they, they're bi-directional. So it's hard to know how to target in a, in a policy framework attitudes. Um, but it just shows that the, what is really needed is are these big scale changes, not just to the environment, but it, you know, in people's, we, got, we have to change people's minds, not just the environment. Okay, so I know I, I said I was gonna talk about scooters and I'm gonna to get to scooters at some point, um, but in order to get there, I need to talk a little bit about research we've done on micromobility services. So looking beyond just the personally owned bicycle, um, we've done a lot of research in, the, in this region, the Sacramento region with the jump bike share that was here until, um, it was in Davis until the pandemic hit and, um, and then was quickly removed. It's now back in Sacramento to a small degree, although scooters are still are now the dominant uh, micromobility service, and there's talks of bikes, emer bike share emerging back in Davis soon. Um, and the few things I wanted to talk about, oh, I should have mentioned, um, this was back in the day where my research helper was my daughter taping uh, flyers to bike seats. This is before we had relationships with all these companies, before we had um, uh, former uh, graduate students working at these companies um, to partner with. And so, it, uh, so back then when we started this research, it was really hard um, because we, we had to do it all ourselves. Um, so some of this um, we're, we're doing better now with, um, with more recent studies. But some, some key takeaways from, from on the sustainability side of what these services uh, may hold is that mode substitution for at least this e-bike share looks really promising. You know, driving and ride hailing are strong are strongly substituted um, and this is pervasive across most micromobility services in the u.s and it was i think it surprised a lot of researchers uh, early on but it's become it's been shown so many times that it's become well known that yes bikes and scooters um, substitute for driving uh, to a large degree walking too but um but also a lot of driving uh, and we looked uh, uh, PhD candidate Tatsuya Fukushigi did some great work on, on this data set, modeling the mode substitution. And what he showed on these plots on the bottom here that really walking is a dominant mode substitution, but as soon as you get past this, you know, 1.5 mile, 1.5 miles, it just quickly rises to uh, driving and ride hailing for most per trip purposes. Um, of course, for recreation, that's not the case, you know, um, for recreation, it's just the trip wouldn't have occurred. So that's 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 the bike share inducing new travel, which has important ramifications, social benefits in and of itself. And like as I said, e-scooters look very similar in reviewing the literature and the studies that have been done. Um, you can see if you look at these colors of um, the yellow, kind of combines private vehicle, taxi, ride hailing. Um, it's a good share of the trips, um, according to survey respondents. 
But the key with with uh, e-scooters are that the trips are much shorter. So you know the potential benefits or the the miles of substitution are potentially less. Although we haven't done a good job at really measuring the impact because we're we're looking so closely at the trip level um, substitution and not holistically at what are these what are these services doing to change people's behavior broadly? Are they connecting to transit? Is that substituting a lot more vehicle miles? Are they changing their whole schedule because of it? Are they being more sustainable because of it, or are they just, you know, adding trips um, and and it's not really changing the big picture of how people travel? Uh, we have a we have many studies now go ongoing that are trying to look at this in more detail. Uh, and then we also done some work at the system level to take all we know. Again, this is Tatsuya's great work um, with this complex model on the left. Um, and what he was able to do is piece together all the needed data, um, both from our survey, from system level trips, um, and a bunch of other sources to estimate how much VMT was being reduced in the Sacramento region. And then we did some some scenario modeling of you know if you ink on the y-axis of increasing the bikes per square mile and how much more VMT could we really reduce? Um, but the big takeaway is that back in the heyday of, of e-bike share a few years before COVID, um, those bikes were reducing about 2.8 um, miles of VMT on average per day. Um, so it seems like a drop in the bucket, but you know it's thousands of VMT per day. Uh, so, so there's potential there, um, especially if these services become kind of Every, in every city. We also tried to look at the broader effects of the bike share on the population um, because we used, we did some household, random household surveys before and during the bike share. Um, but in modeling that, we found that there was really no, nothing we could, all our results were null on behavior change. So these are some um, predicted changes in days biked in the past seven days. And you can see like there's a decline in Sacramento, um, you know, slightly. And otherwise we're kind of all centered around zero. Uh, we couldn't really find that the bike share increased bicycling for the population level. It increased bicycling for the users, and we know that. But, um, but it, when we randomly sampled the population, just not enough people are using um, the service. So it shows a, a key limitation of um, kind of making it a more common service to use. Um, not just this kind of small subset of users. But there are also some other micromobility effects or kind of, um, you know, things that are probably important, but we, we don't really know how important yet. So in this case, um, we measured how aware people were, this is at UC Davis sample, um, of what an e-bike was. And this is before the pandemic, which now after the pandemic, maybe everybody knows what an e-bike was. But in the US in 2018, a UC Davis awareness of what an e-bike was 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 not it wasn't it was about half half of people had ever knew what an e-bike was, um, and you can see uh, that's sorry 2017 that's the green curve on the top, um, and then in 2018 after bike e-bike share comes to Davis there's the blue curve so you see this big jump in awareness and then 2019 again after bike share has been here for now a year and a half. Um, we have e-bike awareness rising steadily. So, so there's there's something to uh, the fact that micromobility services have these other effects um, on you know on changing people's per perspective about modes. Um, people are learning about new modes um, from from using and seeing micromobility services. All right, and uh, I think the big the big step next uh, for micromobility services, and this for the rest of us as a research uh, that want to research this, is to understand that micromobility services are not just one way shares. That's how most people currently see them, because that's the pervasive model um, being pushed. But uh, micromobility services could be much more than that. And some of you are aware of, say, Joe Bike, which launched in in Davis. That's a subscription service. That's uh, it's just basically a lease for a bike, but you get you know free maintenance, and if it's stolen, um, you get a new bike. And I don't even know if they have deductibles. I mean, the, it's a lot of these things are still venture capital funded, so it's unsure of you know how long they're going to last. But um, there are tons of examples, as I put on here with pictures, 
both for freight and for um, just general mobility um, of services that are that are that are kind of this middle ground between owning um, versus one-way shares. And I think in the U.S., there's great potential for this, um, and so I'm not going to be surprised if we start to see a growth here because one-way shares really don't probably don't work outside of dense urban cores. And if we want these services to to be able to reach more people in the U.S., we need to look beyond uh, the dense urban cores because we have a lot of sprawling cities in the U.S. And we know there's growth in the industry. So this is a snapshot from um, Micro Mobility IO about who these companies are. Um, this was back in 2000, summer of 2019, I think. And then a year later, uh, look at the growth in all the companies that are um, that are doing something related to micromobility and mostly micromobility services. Um, and that's that's continuing. So it's great. Uh, we need that. We need to leverage that. And so what I thought I'd do is end the talk with one um, kind of blend of an old strategy with this new technology. And this is a study that's just wrapping up um, that's pretty exciting. And it's about a transportation demand management, you know, kind of uh, what many research transportation researchers might think like this kind of, oh, wishy-wash, like it doesn't do much, but you have to do it kind of thing. Um, and But some companies take transportation demand management seriously um, and because they know that if they put money into it, they can really change their uh, commuter's behavior. And so what, what I was doing in this study is helping, this is, this is Google, I was helping Google understand how much their bike and e-bike lending, um, how much it was doing, increasing the bicycling uh, to their campuses in Mountain View and um, uh, where's the other one? Right next to Mountain View. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, they, they kind of knew, but they didn't know for sure because they hadn't, you know, dug into the data. And then also, what did that mean for their single occupancy vehicle commute? And this program is vast. I mean, it's free e-bike for six months, um, free maintenance, theft protection, emergency pickup. I mean, as you can imagine, Google did anything and everything they could to make this program work. And on the graphic on the right are the, the bike to work rates for all the participants throughout the duration of this program. Um, thousands of participants from starting in 2015, really, to um, just before the pandemic hit. Uh, there's some seasonal variation there um, and some other things that are going on with the drops. Um, and what we found was that that if if we measured bike bike rates before the program, we saw uh, they were pretty low, you know, less than 25% of people um, or bike to work rate was less than 25% for these participants. And once they were in the program, it, it rose to above 50%, so a huge increase in bicycling when they were lent these bikes. Um, and then afterwards, maybe a slight decline. So it's not sticking for all of them, but it's sticking for enough of them to warrant um, you know, some deeper cost-benefit analysis because um, clearly it's changing behavior. And when we modeled what that, that effect was on single occupancy vehicle commute miles, um, it was substantial on the order of you know 400,000 miles reduced um, over the lifetime of the program. So, so this is what I mean by you know something old transportation demand management we've been doing for decades with something new like new new e-bike technology uh, and new you know new small vehicles. Okay, next steps um, along with this behavioral research. Um, I am focused more recently on um, making this kind of applicable to policy. Uh, so that includes uh, current projects on you know, research synthesis for VMT reduction, um, tools for Caltrans to better understand the benefits of active transportation projects, um, some projects with Miguel on cargo bikes for goods movement and micromobility for disaster response. Um, these are kind of new uh, areas of research um, that we're pushing. But also, um, I'm really focused on the need to evaluate interventions. Just like the Google example, um, there are new there are new interventions that are occurring, like e-bike rebate um, programs that are happening in California, um, and those need you know direct evaluation. I think so. We know as you know researchers and as policymakers, um, you know whether 
whether these strategies are going to work in the future. So with that, I'll leave you with um, an image of a roundabout in Davis, maybe one of the busiest roundabouts, um, bike roundabouts, I don't know, in North America. I don't know, maybe someone knows a busier roundabout, but passing period is about to let out. This is at 10 times speed. Um, there it goes. And um, I don't know, I think it's just a fascinating look at uh, how we travel by bike. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Dylan. Very interesting. And a lot of hope about travel demand management and mode substitution. <laughs> so we have uh, a, a few questions. Um, but if anyone wants to ask, to ask some of the questions uh, directly to, to Dylan, we have a question from Ray. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, was, it was really awesome, Dylan, especially the part about your dissertation intuitive research it was really interesting um since you showed the cute photos of your kids um i know you haven't studied this or maybe you have is there any research on the impact of uh, introducing the active transportation modes like bikes to young children in early years and how it it involves through their adulthood in regards to travel behaviors and mode choice? Yes, good question. Yes, there is. Um, it's not, uh, I haven't studied it, um, but there is. there was some great research by Calvin Thigpen on that at UC Davis. Um, and there has been some great research um, on, you know, what we call the life course evaluation of, of, the, of bicycling being introduced. Um, from Europe, um, there's a lot. There's there's a this great longitudinal study that Susan Handy has led for now many many years, um, looking specifically at Davis kids, these Davis kids that she studied that she interviewed when they were, gosh, elementary school, I think have now graduated high school. Um, so there's you know real longitudinal look at what it's like growing up in a bike friendly community and what that means for. Um, their travel behavior later. Um, so yes, it's out there, um, but it's um, it's it's not. I'm, I don't have a good grasp on uh, on all of it. So, but I can help you find it if you like. Sure, thank you. Yoke. Yeah, thank you, Dylan, for your presentation. Um, for those of you who don't know Dylan, and for those students who don't know Dylan yet, besides a, a great researcher, he's also a really good teacher. I don't know if you're still doing the, the bicycle uh, topic class. Oh, still. thank you for bringing it up. Anne-Marie reminded <laughs> me to put a plug in, and I didn't. So yeah, if you're interested in bike and pedestrian planning, I'll be teaching that in the fall. Um, so look for that. So that class was actually a reason for me to to change my thesis towards being more microbially and bicycle focused for those of you who don't know. Um, I had a question about your uh, earlier research that you did uh, combining the, the physio physiological aspects of cycling, uh, and you had that chart with all the factors, environmental, and I think the other one was uh, route or trip uh, oriented factors. And I was wondering if you also took into consideration the difference between a uh, single isolated bicyclists or the difference riding uh, with others or in a group and if that was a, a part that you either took into consideration or something that you think might still be interesting to, to look at. Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I'm not sure if that came up in our discussions on the how you control for everything in a, you know, to understand like an unconscious physiological response to you know stress, but it it's definitely come up a lot in in our survey research. So, for example, in in the high school survey, um, biking with kids or biking with friends is a big predictor of biking, right? So, do your friends bike? Um, so, the social aspect of bicycling matters a lot, especially for um, younger travelers. But it, it, the same is for college students too ask at a UC Davis sample, oh yeah, I bike with my friends, it's fun. Um, but in terms of in terms of 
what impact that might have. I mean, it certainly has an impact on your psychology, right? If you're riding with friends, you're probably talking or thinking about things differently than your um, so you know. And this is the hard part about measuring something in situ, right? You've just got so many things. You have no idea what someone's thinking about. And what they're thinking about could impact their physiology. Um, so we don't have a good sense for how to do that. Yet, um, other than collect a lot of data over a long duration and hope those kinds of things wash out, um, probably is, is what we're going to eventually have to get to. But yeah, great question, Yako. Yeah, and big shout out to your uh, bicycle and pedestrian focus course. It's a really good course for those who haven't taken it yet. Thank you. Tricia? Uh, hi, Dylan. Thanks so much. I learned a lot uh, from your presentation. And um, so one, one thing I was wondering more about is how, how like, how we know uh, car trips are being replaced by micromobility. And um, do you think that would hold in a place like Davis? Like, um, I would think that by like uh, non e-bike, just bicycle trips would get replaced by um, e-bike trips uh, since you have such a large bike share. Yeah, good question. Um, so how we know uh, so far, uh, all the evidence is based on post-ride counterfactual survey responses. So I call them retrospective counterfactuals. Lots of validity concerns, if that's what you're thinking, yes, right? Um, someone, someone rides something, it, it's now, now the operators are doing this in app. So you finish, you finish a ride and you collect survey data in app. So that's, you know, really close to the behavior. So maybe it's easier. But when we were doing it, it was look at your app on the last ride and tell us what you would have used if that, if that bike wasn't there. Um, and, and some researchers are getting a little more complex and, and we're doing this too in some of our recent surveys of looking at broader changes, like would you have gone to the same location if that service wasn't there? Um, but they're all essentially retrospective counterfactual surveys. Um, in our current work, we're, we're trying new techniques where we're measuring travel behavior um, passively. Um, so we're looking at an individual's use of a car, so their vehicle miles over a three week period and their use of micromobility. And on days when one goes up, we're hoping to see what the other goes down, right? So just that's another way that we think we might be able to measure the, the mode substitution um, is, is just longitudinal looks at mode use uh, at an individual level. Um, and in terms of the Davis, sure, it's context specific. Mode substitution is very context specific. So the best example I can give is if you look at all these city surveys in, in American cities, you see this pretty strong 30 to 40 percent uh, people say they would have used a car ride hailed. It's, it's not in every city, but in most major cities. But then if you look in Europe, the surveys look very different. The car substitution in Europe is much smaller. Transit substitution is much greater. Um, and and so, so, yeah, it is very context specific. I think there's that makes the case for the benefit in the U.S. I think American cities just they can benefit more because we're so car dependent. Um, but in a place like Davis, yes, there's probably a lot of, of bike substitution. Um, I can't remember the exact data that we have, um, whether the bike substitution in Davis was greater than in Sacramento. It probably was, but um, but yeah, good, good thoughts and great question. Thank you. Thank you. Maria? Thanks, Dylan, for your presentation. I had two related questions uh, that I've seen actually like a lot of discussion about in Twitter. One is the design of bike lanes by only using paint instead of using a maybe more permanent infrastructure and how that influences the actual decision of uh, riding or not. And I guess it's part of like one of the factors that you had in one of those, um, in, in one of the studies. And a related one is also like a policy and safety measure, which is the use of helmets and how like required they should be because in Europe they've been like taking off the requirements so that people use the bicycles more. So I wanted to know from your studies, uh, what have you uh, 
what is like the, the take on these two elements? Sure, great questions. The, uh, the infrastructure take is pretty clear now, protected infra um, bike lanes are greatly preferred. So if, um, they cause more mode substitution or they cause, they cause people to bike more um, in, the, in the few studies that have done that. If, most of these studies are like before and after evaluations of bike volumes, but they're also survey, they're also doing intercept surveys along routes. So they're looking and they're asking people, um, what did you do before? So there's still a retrospective counterfactual, but yeah, we know protected lanes um, are doing more to encourage bicycling than painted lanes. Uh, they cost more. So the question is, uh, and the, what's the context and what's the right infrastructure that's very context specific. And the one study that we, um, we did um, in, in Berkeley and with the UC Davis population, we talk a little bit about this idea of a design person. So in design guides, we have design vehicles, we have design, all kinds of design standards. And we were, we were, our, our big kind of conceptual contribution was, what if we have this person that's this kind of, um, they don't feel very comfortable riding a bike. They don't have really strong bike attitudes. Um, you know, basically this is the person that we should be planning for. We should be designing for this person. If we can satisfy their comfort, then we can probably satisfy everyone's comfort. Um, and then on the helmet side, um, I haven't done any research on helmet. We ask people, you know, sometimes in our surveys about their helmet use, but I think the comment that you just made about re reducing the, the mandatoriness of helmets, I think it's pretty clear that, that most bike advocates and researchers agree we need to reduce barriers to bicycling. So, so mandating helmets is probably a bad thing. Uh, there's some fascinating research um, out there on the micro level behaviors of drivers with helmet and non-helmet use. And I wish I had the source for you, but for what I can recall are little things like drivers passing slightly closer to bicyclists that are wearing helmets than not, right? Things that you just wouldn't think about. Um, so in terms of the, we know helmets save lives, right? So they are, they are a good safety measure, but at the macro scale, whether mandating them is a good or bad uh, reason. I think I personally fall on the, the side of it's a bad thing, um, but it's it's hotly debated, you're right. Maha? Thank you, Dylan, very interesting talk. Um, so I was a bit curious about that slide where you said that some, something about tax incentives for shared bike share. Um, are micro mobility companies currently taxed or are they not taxed? And like closely related to, I think what Trisha brought up, uh, the mode substitution question. Like I think initially when ride sharing companies came into the limelight, they had some tax incentives, but then it was shown that they are really displacing um, transit use rather than car use. And so now they're taxed. So in this context, and then we do know that transit and walk are kind of displaced by bike share. So do you think that kind of, puts us in a position where these services might be taxed eventually? Like how do you think about that? Well, I think it's, it's when you say, when you say taxed, what, in what, what do you mean by taxed? Like uh, the taxes that ride sharing companies pay, um, just operate, operating taxes. Oh, okay, yeah. So yeah, micro mobility companies are operating like any other private business. Um, now they're they're actually paying fees to operate in most cities, so they're paying more, um, uh, and so in a sense they have a disadvantage because I don't know. I guess ride hail companies may I don't think I don't think Lyft and Uber are paying fees in very many cities. I don't know if someone may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, um, but most most micro mobility service companies are now, um, and. Yeah, I'll, I, I'll, I'll table that for whether that's a good thing or bad thing for later, but um, I want to get back to the, the, the transit substitution thing. I think um, the evidence in, in the U.S. Yeah. is that transit substitution is, is, isn't as near as big as ride hailing. I mean, it's, it's there to some degree, and it's there in, in cities that have good transit. It's there in European cities. Um, but I think we have to take a broader look at 
okay, it's substituting some walking and some transit, but if it's substituting enough car use or, or broader even, if it's not at the trip level, but if it's changing the way people think about how they get around, and that means eventually you know, selling a vehicle. I mean, those are big, big changes. And that's what we want to look for. So, um, so while I, 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 I'm with you on that, we have to be careful. We don't want to be subsidizing something that's going to hurt us. Um, I think we need to take a step back. And I think there's this, there's a, there's a side with ride hailing. Some people see ride hailing as this, yeah, it's doing bad things now, but if we could leverage it with automated vehicles and pooling, you know, we have the Holy Grail. Um, I don't know if I'm in that camp. Actually, I'm not in that camp. Um, I think that 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 potential is great, but I think the 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 risk is much greater to subsidize something like that 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 we're not going to get that with bike share and scooter share. I don't think the risk is all that great for um, you know increasing BMT. I guess. Thank you. Yeah. Akasha. Yeah. Hi, Dylan. Thank Hi. you for the presentation. Yeah. So my question is, like, the jump service was there in Davis a few years back, and then now it's 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 still operating in Sacramento. So, in your analysis, did you find any like significant differences between the kind of shift mode shift that has happened in Davis vis-a-vis -vis Sacramento because of uh, because yeah, there are there are different uh, differences in geographies of these two cities, and then Davis. Uh, I assume like there are much shorter trips in Davis as compared to uh, what like trip lengths of Sacramento residents. So, what variations were there? Yeah, so um, trip lengths are a little shorter. We have Tetsuya's models. Is this for just Davis? Oh, um, we've got these. So the curves on the right, I don't know if you can still see my screen, but um, yes, there's more, there's more, there's so many more trips in Davis um, per capita that um, we actually had greater VMT reduction, oh, we have greater per capita VMT reduction in um, in Davis. So so even even though maybe the trips are a little shorter, fact that there were so many of them um, added up. Um, but yeah, I mean, we do find that obviously longer trips are substituting for, for cars more. So so if you think of like just the share of, of mode substitution, like that's what we tend to report. 35% of trips are substituted by car. The miles are much greater than 35%, right? Because it's the longer trips that are doing car substitution. Um, and yeah, I, th I think I think there's lots of variation. Um, and so probably cities need to be aware of the fact that if their city, their city specific, you know, if, if, if their micro mobility service is substituting for transit and not cars, like they should think hard about before they subsidize it. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, Thank you for the presentation, Dylan. I just wanted to ask you about um, earlier, like earlier when you asked your question, you talked about how con like the context of a place is very important to how we apply uh, these concepts. I was wondering how this study could be applied to some place like the Midwest to help restructure their infrastructure because there's areas where there's like um, even like. Um, not talking about a bike lanes, there's not even a sidewalk for people to like, you know, just go from like a five, like a five mile radius to a place nearby or three mile radius where um, there's like a sidewalk in front of like one like building, but then around the other ones, there's there's nothing because their infrastructure is um, almost solely oriented around cars where some places they have like a 20 mile, I mean, sorry, like a, a 20 lane wide highway so I was just wondering how you, how this could be applied to some place like that. Yeah, um, good question. I think that you're talking about kind of extreme sprawling cities, um, and it's a really hard it's a hard question to answer because 
if distances are that far, um, there's there's probably no bicycling or very little destination oriented bicycling going on, and so it's hard to it's hard to see investing in things like protected bike lanes when there's no bicycling currently going on. So I think probably what needs to happen in those contexts is you know it's going to be slower, but land use um, you know needs to change, right? New development needs to start to restructure the city so that bicycling can occur. Uh, and this takes decades. This is not a quick fix. Um, but but you're right. You can't just make you can't make a bicycling you can't make an auto oriented sprawling city bike friendly by just plopping down bike infrastructure. Um, it's got to have all, all these other things. You've got to have you really need bike accessibility, and to have that, you need to have destinations closer to each other. We have a couple that I don't think have been answered yet uh, on the Q and A and the chat. So the first one is uh, looking into experiences from the 1950s and on there, the, uh, the person is asking that drivers have been less accommodating to bicyclists uh, with the increase in bicycling specific infrastructure. Have there been any analysis on the driving perception of bicyclists given that now there is more infrastructure? Good question, yes. Um... There, there's a little bit. Um, it's, it's there, most of the bike research is on bicyclists and bicycling, not on the driver's perception. But um, Tara Goddard, who was actually um, was in Davis, she was the bike ped coordinator for Davis for a while before she got her PhD at Portland State. Now she's a professor at uh, Texas A&M. Uh, she has some fascinating studies on drivers' perspective of bicyclists, mostly on the safety angle, um, but I encourage you to look up Tara's work um, on that on that topic. Thank you. There's another question about if there's any program like Joe Bike that focuses on utility bikes or e-bikes. Yeah, so Joe Bike is um, unique in the US, but swap feats it's basically swap feats, which has been, I don't know how many years swap feats has been running in the Netherlands and, and swap feats is, has extended well beyond the Netherlands to um, many countries in, in Europe. So, so the idea of, um, of a bike lease and slash maintenance slash theft protection has been around for a while, but it's, it, it hasn't really made it in the U S. So Joe bike is, is one of the early, you know, attempts. That there have been other attempts, like you know, Bird. Um, Bird has always had this like kind of attempt at a long-term lease of their scooters, and other micro, other one-way share um, micro mobility companies have been have been um, working on that. Wheels has one. Um, so so there are examples, um, but they're they're pretty rare still in the U.S. Thanks. Another question about. When you were discussing the results of the research at Google, uh, do you know if Google is Google charging for parking? <laughs> nope. <Okay. laughs> yeah, I talked to them a lot about um, so parking is a big issue. They're trying to reduce parking demand through carrots and not sticks, basically. Um, I think there's a you know there's higher up uh, in the decision process fears about. Um, competitiveness, you know, having a parking, parking, free parking is seen as a must to be a competitive employer. Um, so yeah, it's too bad because there's so much great evidence um, that pricing parking can can have, you know, a really strong effect on, on commute shifting. But yeah, for now, Google is just focused on trying to solve the problem with incentives rather than disincentives. Perfect. We have another question, and, and I know we have discussed this, especially for cargo bikes, but when we are promoting micromobility, and let's say all this picks up and everybody just shifts to micromobility, uh, have there been any research or a bit, at, at least thinking about when we get micromobility congestion, and we have that at UC Davis inside the campus, uh, have, it, have there been any analysis on the stress due to congestion generated by micromobility for micromobility users? 
Um, well, I don't, I don't know about for shared micromobility yet. Um, the, 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 the studies on this kind of micro on bike congestion pretty much as far as I know, and then maybe there are others that come out of the Netherlands and China, right? The two kind of countries that have a, have a lot of biking. So, um, but a, a lot of those are re under, are they're, they're taking, they're taking, um, transportation engineering concepts of, you know, flow and applying them to the bike, which is quite different how people stop and how people accelerate. And, and so it's more about safety and, and throughput, right? They want to move bikes, um, quickly. So, um, signal timing for bikes rather than cars, things like that. Um, but in terms of stress, I don't know if I've seen anything. It doesn't mean it's not out there, but, um, um, I know, and maybe all of us have experienced, yeah, riding in a busy roundabout in Davis can be pretty stressful. Um, it's also kind of fun, um, but um, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I've definitely been stopped, dead stopped in a roundabout at, uh, at Davis. Just congestion, bike congestion, got to put your foot down. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. We have another question in the, in the Q and A. So have there been any analysis looking at kind of the, the multimodal, the connection with micromobility and transit or Amtrak and how this can promote the, the two way where depending on the weather, something happens to the bike, they can still travel back and forth, just mounting uh, the bike or the scooter on the racks and any other accommodation for micromobility on these transit services. Yeah, so bikes on trains is in general a not a good strategy. It works for things like Amtrak when it's a few bikes, um, but countries that know this that have a lot of um, that have a lot of train travel and bike travel, they know it doesn't scale. You just can't fit a lot of bikes and people on a train. Trains just aren't designed for that, and so um, so I guess. It works in the case where it's an anomaly, but it doesn't work when it's the norm. Um, but related to that is the idea of, of a bike share. So again, like I wanted to push this idea of all bike shares aren't this one way thing. Um, so for example, the bike, the common bike, a common bike share in the Netherlands, um, OV Fiets, I think, uh, operates as, it's operated by the transit provider as a connector so you you rent the bike for a day or half a day or whatever and it's your bike to get to and from whether you're you're accessing or egressing from transit um it's a fabulous system and it makes a ton of sense because it, you don't you don't want to be stranded far away from transit if transit is your main you know main access point in and out of the city if it's a commuter rail um, so you need it throughout your day to move around and it and it doesn't have to be loaded onto the train, um, so there are lots of of these kinds of ideas that just that we need to start to think about and um, and that that can do this um, connection issue. Uh, Hossein, uh, who may be in here, I'm not sure, um, a PhD student. He's he's doing his, his almost his entire dissertation is on this idea of connecting micro mobility and transit. So and there's there's lots of studies on it. Um, but it's a hard thing to study when you don't have integrated pavements. It's really hard to know when people are actually connecting to transit. So um, we're, we're working on that, but um, integrated pavements seems to be the key. And in most cases, we just, we don't have it yet.